Terror management theory is just our haiku-like summation of Becker. It's the uniquely human awareness of death gives rise to potentially debilitating existential terror that we manage uh, by embracing cultural worldviews that give us a sense of meaning and value. Therefore, whether we're aware of it or not, uh, we are at all times fundamentally motivated to maintain a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. And finally, whenever we are challenged, our sense of meaning or value, or whenever concerns about death are aroused, we will respond defensively in ways to restore confidence in our beliefs uh, and faith that we're people of value. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 158. And this episode is with Pins, the podcast, and Sheldon Solomon, who's professor of psychology at Skidmore College. And Sheldon is, is best known for developing terror management theory, which is an awesome name for a theory, with Tom Pushjinsky and Jeff Greenberg, which explores human psychology and mortality. And in this episode, we discuss basically two things. We, we talk about Ernest Becker's groundbreaking book, The Denial of Death, and then how it, I guess, three things, how it influenced Sheldon and his collaborators, and then how since then, since reading this book, when they were in, I think it was in graduate school that they encountered it, um, They've studied with the tools of contemporary social social psychology how humans are afflicted by their sense of mortality. And their magnum opus on the topic is called The Worm at the Core, which is another great title, uh, a trend in, in Sheldon's career. And one clarification that I wanted to make right at the beginning is that I misspoke at one point in the episode – uh, when comparing, comparing, I started saying fear and compare. When, when comparing the fear of death and public speaking, what I believe I intended to say since we had this conversation over a month ago now, uh, was that you often hear that people are more afraid of public speaking than dying. And I often found this unbelievable until I realized that what was meant by this saying was likely either that people spend more time worrying about public speaking than dying, or if you ask people to imagine both of them, they find the public speaking more anxiety inducing, though it, it still seems much more likely to me that they'd, they'd rather do that than die. So comments, like subscribes, reviews, follows, please love them. Can't get enough of them, not getting enough of them. Uh, but would like to be getting closer to enough of them. And without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Sheldon. As I just mentioned, there are there are two books I'd like to talk about today. So one that influenced you and, and one that you wrote, and both of which center around death. But I think that we should make a, a brief anachronistic detour at the outset to The Worm at the Core, which you wrote with Jeff Greenberg and Tom Chijinsky. And I, I understand that you were first most interested in the broad question of why people act the way they do, which seemed to be explained by first self-esteem and then second, a drive to assert dominance over others. And how did these two principles lead you to connect with Becker's work and the denial of death? Wow, Robinson, great question. Uh, Jeff uh, Greenberg, Tom Pazinski, and I uh, were... Uh, friends and graduate students together um, in a PhD program in experimental social psychology at the University of Kansas in the 1970s. Um, and we were interested um, in understanding self-esteem. Uh, William James, the guy who started psychology, said that self-esteem is as important to humans as basic emotions like hunger and fear. 
uh, are to other critters. Uh, but from our perspective, psychologists hadn't made much progress besides agreeing with William James that self-esteem uh, was important. Well, I, I get to Skidmore College as a young professor in 1980, and I bump into two books uh, by Ernest Becker, recently deceased cultural anthropologist. One is called The Birth and Death of Meaning, and it's in the first paragraph of that book uh, that Becker says that he wants to understand why the people do what they do when they do it. And I remember being like, yo, uh, finally, uh, you know, not something that, you know, is like a non-pharmacological intervention for insomnia, just loaded uh, with jargon. He was like, hey, I just want to figure out why people behave the way they do. And in that book, Robinson, he has a chapter that is where he says self-esteem is the dominant motive of the human animal, that what ultimately drives us is the need to perceive that life has meaning, and moreover, that we have value in the context of the meaningful framework that we embrace. And then right next to the birth and death of meaning was uh, the book, The Denial of Death. Uh, Becker won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for that book 50 years ago. It was published in 1973. And it is in that book uh, that Becker says, look, I thought self-esteem uh, was the mother load uh, in terms of explanatory power. Uh, but he said, I now know that that's descriptive, but not explanatory in the sense that what underlies our pervasive efforts to perceive that life has meaning and we have value it is the need to mitigate the potentially debilitating existential terror uh, that's engendered uh, by the realization of the inevitability of our own demise. And I, I just remember, again, as a young punk in my 20s, uh, when Becker said, uh, you know, it, it's the knowledge of the inevitability of death and our disinclination to accept the reality of the human condition. That's the motivational impetus for a substantial proportion of human behavior. I was like, I, two things. One is I called Tom and Jeff immediately and I said, we have to read this fucking guy. He has an explanation uh, for why people are so driven to pursue self-esteem. But then on the very personal front, I, I realized that, that, that these ideas resonated with me in part because of my own personal disinclination to die. Uh, so I remember vividly when I was eight years old when I realized uh, that I, too, would someday die. Uh, and I, I'm not a big fan of death. I'm still disinclined, uh, you know, 60 or 70 years later. Uh, but so that's basically how we bumped into uh, Ernest Becker's work. I, I found it appealing both personally and professionally. Hmm. Since self-esteem is so important, not just to William James or to Becker or to your work. I mean, you quoted him in that first book as saying that self-esteem is the dominant motive of the human animal in addition to making or believing that life has meaning. I don't think we should just leave it as tacitly understood. I think we should really flesh out what it is. So we all, I guess, have an idea of what self-esteem means, but what does it really consist in when we're getting down to brass tacks and trying to be specific and rigorous? Yeah. Again, really a uh, fine question. Uh, and, um, the Becker's approach, and this is the one that we have adopted, um, is to, uh, uh, in his technical definition is the, it is the perception that one is a person of value in a world of meaning. And, and the way that Becker um, breaks that notion down in, in the birth and death of meaning, he says, okay, let's do meaning first. And he's like, hey, I'm an anthropologist. Every culture has an account of the origin of the universe. Every culture has a prescription uh, for how we ought behave while we're here. 
And, and every culture offers a promise of immortality, be it literal or, or symbolic. And so Becker starts just uh, w- with the declaration uh, that the apprehending that life has meaning it is just the bedrock of psychological equanimity. Yet, and he makes that argument both on common sense as well as clinical, and we now know empirically uh, that that's the case. Uh, n- no one wakes up in the morning except for maybe a nihilist in a Dostoevsky novel, that, and it's like, oh, life is uh, totally meaningless. Uh, let's celebrate. And, and the second book that Becker wrote after The Birth and Death of Meaning was about depression, uh, where he argued that regardless of the biochemical or neuroanatomical underpinnings of depression, uh, that it always comes down to uh, an inability or an unwillingness to perceive life as meaningful. All right, but then Becker goes on and he says meaning is necessary, uh, but not sufficient that uh, in addition to perceiving that life is meaningful, we also need to perceive uh, that we meet or exceed the standards of value that are associated with the social role that we inhabit in the context of our culture. You know, so if you're a nurse, your job's to save lives. If you're a, a warrior, your job is to kill people. If you're a banker, your job is to make money. Uh, and the, the Becker argument that we have adopted uh, in our work, which is basically just 40 years of empirical research, we're egghead experimental social psychologists. And so we felt uh, that Becker's ideas were quite compelling uh, when he said that self-esteem is believing uh, that life has meaning and you have value. And then he said that the primary function of self-esteem is to minimize anxiety. Uh, And uh, so what we did thereafter was to just conduct egghead research uh, to test that particular hypothesis. So this was one of the first studies uh, that we did uh, where we showed if you momentarily elevate people's self-esteem and then threaten them, Sometimes quite literally, like in one study, we raised people's self-esteem momentarily. We told them they were about to receive painful electrical shocks, and we measured physiological arousal. And sure enough, momentarily elevated or dispositionally high self-esteem reduced both self-reported anxiety as well as physiological arousal. And, And but that, that particular study has been replicated in a variety of ways more than a dozen times. And so it's on both empirical as well as theoretical grounds that uh, we argue that Becker is on the right track when he describes self-esteem uh, as an anxiety buffer. Now, this is not to suggest, however, that that is the only way to procure psychological equanimity. But from Becker's perspective, it's a central one. Hmm. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to getting into more depth into your empirical work that the three of you and other collaborators have performed. But I'd still like to dig a bit more into the foundations with Becker before we get into that. And one, just to maybe give us a contemporary secular context in which to frame this idea that self-esteem is the perception that one is a person of value in a world of meaning. Maybe today where people value others for their beauty, their wealth, their intellectual accomplishments, their fame, then to believe that one has self-esteem on this view is to believe that these things are meaningful and that one scores highly in these sorts of categories. Is that roughly on the right track? Yeah, no, Robinson, that is actually you nailed it. And, uh, you know, while we're on this point, I don't want to go too far afield, but that also helps us understand uh, why uh, we are right now uh, suffering uh, from, uh, you know, literally a pandemic uh, of psychological dis-ease. In other words, right now, uh, America is a petri dish of psychopathology. Depression is many times higher than it ever was. A third of the people in America 
uh, are addicted to drugs and alcohol. You know, the other third are spraying cheese whiz on a cracker while they down a 12 pack of beer before they jump in their car uh, to drive a couple of miles, you know, to get to Walmart to buy a machine gun and a lemon. Uh, in other words, there's no um, I, I think there's no disagreement that we're in a pervasive state right now of psychological dis-ease, and that's independent of the pandemic. And, and uh, your philosophy guy, uh, you know, Michael Sandel at Harvard wrote a book called The Tyranny of Merit. Yes. Um, and I, I, I like that book a lot for a variety of reasons, but Becker made the same point in the 1970s, which is that whenever you see wholesale misery in a society, you should take a look at what that culture values to assess whether or not those standards are, are attainable for the average individual. So Sandel's point, and you, it, he would say the same thing that you did, Robinson. Uh, we want to be rich. We want to be famous. We want to be Olympic athletes uh, and world class musicians. And we live in a society uh, that Sandel puts it, we live in what we describe as a meritocracy where every one of us supposedly starts in the same place and we all therefore get to strive for excellence. The problem he points out is that we only value people in our world as if they're the absolute best at what they do. So doesn't matter if you have a lot of money, Elon Musk has more. It doesn't matter if you're pretty the woman on the cover of Cosmopolitan, who doesn't look like that because she's 20 percent tinier, they photoshopped her. But my point is, if you want a silver medal in the Olympics, you're still a loser. And Sandel's point is that we have created a recipe for psychological despair uh, by living in a culture where N minus one people in every social category are failures. And as Sandel puts it, it shouldn't surprise us that half of America is depressed and the other half is enraged. And uh, so, yeah, but back to the point, the uh, self-esteem is garnered by embracing generally dominant cultural values and then striving uh, to attain or exceed them. And what you were just talking about with regard to Sandel, I mean, this points to the prescriptive dimension at the end of the worm at the core. How do we live or change the way we conceive of life to mitigate the prevalence of the psychological dis-ease that you referred to? But I first read The Denial of Death about 10 years ago. And at that point, in my life, I wasn't ready for it. I mean, some that happens with some books, you change and you read them differently. I, at the time, didn't understand psychoanalysis, not that I necessarily understand it now, but I didn't realize the immense value that it has. So I, I wasn't ready for it and I didn't really internalize it. As I read the book, what, what stuck out at me were some of the more far-fetched ideas. Uh, so one that I remember to this day and was, even though I, I just reread the book, was this idea that man has always had these visions or fantasies of uh, sucking his own penis to, to uh, propagate himself and live on forever. And that just, that did not resonate with me at the time. But what I would like to do, because I am so much more interested in psychoanalysis now, is talk a little bit about the roots of that in Becker's work. And he announces at the beginning of the denial of death that one of his tasks is to tie psychology after Freud back to Kierkegaard. And Freud, as I understand it, conceived of sexuality as the primary motivator in human psychology. And I'm wondering if there's maybe a simple way of explaining why that is and how through Kierkegaard, Becker sought to reorient it around death. Wow. Uh, that, yeah, that's a uh, big question. <laughs> no, that, uh, but, but you captured, honestly, that brilliant. I, I think you honestly, um, you know, Basically, I think that Becker is one of the most underappreciated thinkers of the 
last century because of what he attempted to do. I mean, okay, so trivia point, and that is that the, the, when Becker wrote that book, he didn't call it the denial of death. Um, it was actually twice the size, and I can't remember the exact title, uh, but the subtitle was something like the merger of religion and science. And uh, Becker's original intention, which is, which comes out a little bit in the denial of death, but it was originally the primary focus, is that if you just step back in the Judeo-Christian tradition and look at the development of theological uh, uh, systems of thought, uh, that they run very parallel. Uh, to the psychodynamic ones, especially if we're willing to uh, talk about, when we're talking about psychoanalysis, we can use the word neurosis in religious terms. Uh, following Tillich and Kierkegaard, um, he uses the word sin. So that was kind of like the first thing, is that Becker's trying to integrate and synthesize ideas from a, a variety of disciplines. And he says straight up at the beginning of the denial of death uh, that the, we've got enough truth. The world's choking on truth. Uh, and what we need to do is to step back and to recognize uh, ideas that are coming up independently from all of these different disciplinary directions. I, and then he says that uh, he thinks that Freud is, you know, one of the most important intellectual voices in history. And with all due respect, though, that uh, Freud got it wrong uh, in his insistence uh, that, where, that when, when, he re when he argues that the primary, primary motivational impetus of human behavior is, is sex and aggression. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I taught this stuff uh, at a prison when I first got here. So in the 1980s, I'm at a maximum security prison uh, teaching about Freud. Uh, and the prisoners are like, yeah, fighting and fucking. He's got it. Freud's got it uh, exactly right. Uh, and Freud's argument, though, uh, you know, a lot of people are horrified uh, by, psycho uh, by psychoanalysis. And, um, and they're like, wow, Freud's making this stuff up. But he got that from Darwin. You know, Freud is writing and thinking at the same time that uh, Darwin is doing his thing. And Freud thought that the insistence on sex and aggression being foundational uh, was just uh, a manifestation of Darwin's argument that uh, basically, you know, in order to stay alive, uh, you have to compete in a world of limited resources, hence that aggression may have a biological basis. And, and then in the long run, it's not whether or not you stay alive, but whether or not your snippets of genetic material persist over time, hence the need to reproduce. And so that, that was the, for the, the, the at least epistemological foundation for uh, starting uh, with uh, sex and aggression. Uh, but if you read Freud carefully, um, uh, he, uh, uh, over the decades, he became less and less convinced and, 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 uh, and got more and more existential. So he writes a book beyond the uh, pleasure principle, and he starts talking uh, about what he calls the death instinct, that uh, we have this natural tendency, uh, and this is, again, based on Newton, uh, going towards entropy. Uh, and so by the end of his life, it's like it's not so much uh, sex and aggression. Uh, it's more about eros uh, in opposition to Thanatos. And, and Becker's point is, is he's like Freud got very close to acknowledging that what's at stake is ultimately existential concerns about death. Uh, but uh, what Becker argues, and there's a chapter about Freud in The Denial of Death, is that Freud himself was terrified of dying uh, and that 
his death denial uh, was to inflate himself up to superhuman proportions. And basically, he could never see death anxiety as central to understanding human affairs uh, because he was so afraid of himself dying. And so what Becker insists is that you can take all of the psychoanalytic concepts uh, that are based on sex and aggression, and you can recast them in existential terms uh, to represent efforts to minimize death anxiety. And it's with that in mind uh, that he uses Kierkegaard uh, as an example of existential psychology before uh, existential psychology, and that, that because it, it Kierkegaard really is all about people being uh, so smart that they become uh, aware of their own existence. At which point, in she's uh, I can't even remember um, the little book that Kierkegaard wrote uh, doesn't really matter, but uh, where he talks about that um, awe and dread are the natural result uh, of self-awareness. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's from there that Becker really moves on to develop his arguments about existential anxieties and the defensive reactions that are engendered thereby. Hmm. So a minute ago, you said the mitigation of death anxiety. That's a, a phrase that you used. And I think it's a crucial phrase because... That, of course, is the driving principle of human behavior that uh, becomes substantiated in the pursuit of self-esteem and the establishment of these guiding worldviews. And a central concept for Becker, there are, there are just a couple that I wanted to flesh out before we move on to the worm at the core, but a, a crucial concept that is directly relevant to the mitigation of death anxiety is that of uh, man's urge to heroism. And what does heroism mean? Why does it figure into the denial of death? And how does it relate to this mitigation of our anxiety? Yeah. No, no, again, very awesome. So basically what Becker does is at the very beginning of the denial of death, he says, look, in, my la in, in the birth and death of meaning, I talked about self-esteem. And, and he starts off the denial of death uh, with a quote by William James, which is that basically life is just a theater for heroism. And, and uh, he, uh, what he says is, look, when one way to think about self-esteem it is that we're striving for heroic transcendence. Uh, the, and that uh, the way I like to talk about it, Robinson, is I'm like, well, when we think about heroism, and I'm getting this from uh, Rollo May's book, The Cry for Myth. He's an existential therapist. And, and, uh, and Rollo May, uh, based on Becker, says the same thing, that we're, we're striving for heroic transcendence. All right now, Sometimes that means heroic with a capital H. You know, I want to be uh, like General MacArthur and win a war. I want to be like Einstein uh, and, uh, you know, come up with the theory of relativity or I want to be an Olympic athlete. And, and we're quite familiar uh, with that kind of heroism. And hopefully it's fairly obvious uh, how that has death denying qualities because basically in uh in mythological terms uh, a hero is kind of a larger than life individual uh who is often able by virtue of their capacities to forestall death even if not uh permanently uh, but then there's a you know there's just another kind of heroism uh, and i i call that heroic with a little h uh, and for me, uh, that would consist of just making the best uh, of the circumstances that you find yourself in uh, in uh, your life. And so 
uh, from that perspective, uh, you know, you might be walking around outside and notice that somebody who's, uh, let's say, visually impaired uh, is about to walk into traffic. Uh, and so you go out of your way to help that individual uh, not get run over. Uh, well, that also has a heroic dimension. Uh, and uh, what we know empirically is that when we perceive uh, that what we're doing has any kind of tinge uh, of heroic qualities. It really does serve to enhance meaning and value. Hmm. Going back to this idea of the tyranny of merit, then heroism with a capital H in the contemporary worldview might be something like striving to achieve these values of fame, wealth, and so on, which one takes on almost as a mission. But then I think heroism with a lowercase H is more of a timeless worldview agnostic sort of feature of life that might also be healthier for. Oh, yeah. So uh, no, Robinson, right. I, I, I love how you put that uh, because there are some folks now that dabble in a concept and they call it existential appreciation. Uh, and they point out that there that people that find life most meaningful are not necessarily striving uh, for, uh, you know, world dominance in the form of excellence so much as they are just profoundly appreciative of whatever it is that they happen to be doing. So when I said earlier that Becker puts a lot of stock on, on self-esteem, and so do I, uh, but more recently, folks in positive psychology, uh, they've been that uh, they look at things a little bit differently. But I do think in ways that might ultimately be um, happier uh, and healthier. Uh, and so uh, there's a concept in clinical psychology these days called cosmic insignificance. That just when you realize that you're an inconsequential speck of respiring dust born in a time and place, not of your choosing, here for a tiny amount of time before you're summarily obliterated. Well, some people find that incredibly demoralizing. And yet other people find it tremendously uplifting. And it turns out that what appears to mediate that difference is whether you perceive yourself as connected to everything and everyone around you. Uh, and so the Otto Ronk, who was one of Freud's dudes that Becker writes about uh, in The Denial of Death, uh, in one of his books, Truth and Reality, he says that uh, human beings are, geez, I forget what he called us, something like the, uh, like that word, he's, I forget the phrase, but he points out that we're all related uh, to the first form of life, uh, and uh, and that basically uh, we're descended from that first form of life. That makes us related to everything that has ever existed, everything that exists now, everything that ever will exist. And, and their point is, is there is something quite comforting and uplifting about just being part of the intricate web of life, as it were. And, and uh, I'm being long-winded here, Robinson, but I guess what I'm pointing out is that that appears to be another viable vehicle uh, to towards psychological equanimity. I don't need to be the best at everything that I do. Uh, I can uh, appreciate whatever it is that I happen to be doing. And in positive psychology lingo, uh, they talk about like a tripod uh, of, uh, of interrelated affectations that they describe it in terms of awe, humility, and gratitude. So they're, they're just saying, again, a lot of these concepts uh, are intertwined with the way the Kierkegaards and the Tillichs and the Boobers of the world see it theologically. It's just that at our best, um, we're, we we sometimes just find it awesome to be alive. Uh, and we don't need anything in particular to have happened in order to appreciate 
uh, that in, in joyous exuberance, the fact that we're here. And uh, the, according to the positive psychology types, when you're in a state of awe, it, it also makes us humble, not self-deprecating, uh, but just that we recognize our position relative to the rest of the universe when we're in a state of awe and in a state of humility, it, it makes us more uh, saliently aware of the fact that our lives are probably better than most, or at least the way I talk about it with the students. I'm like, hey, if you slept in a bed last night and had breakfast today, uh, you should be extraordinarily grateful. So back to the original point, yeah, I do think there are different routes to heroic transcendence. I think they're all vehicles to acquire a sense of meaning and value. And this is not to denigrate self-esteem, uh, but I do argue these days that it's time to uh, consider broadening the palette of options uh, that uh, can be provided for people. Uh, in order to satisfy what are essentially the same basic foundational psychological needs uh, for meaning and value. Mm -hmm. And of course, the difficulty isn't in just understanding that achieving fame and fortune won't make us happy, but that integrating into a, a web of life will, but deeply ingraining it in one psyche and displacing the, the quite deeply entrenched uh, tyranny of merit. That's the real difficult part. But relating, uh, relating importantly, I think, to this notion of heroism is another terminological uh, peculiarity maybe of Becker. I don't know if it's, if it's used elsewhere, if it's a term of art in psychoanalysis, but what is his idea of a causa sui project. What is a causa sui? He talks about the, that a great deal. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this is to my discredit that I uh, I should know what that term means in Latin, uh, but it really is related to this drive for heroism. Uh, and so basically what he's arguing is that whether we're aware of it or not, we all unconsciously have some idea uh, of what it is that we're doing as individuals to strive for immortality. So what Becker says is that Freud's immortality project was to be known as the discoverer uh, of uh, psychoanalysis. Uh, you might say that um, Bill Gates's immortality project would be to be the discoverer of Microsoft, or maybe in his later days to have been associated with encouraging uh, super wealthy people to give some of their money back. All right, but it might be that your immortality project um, is more, uh, more at least superficially modest. Johnny Appleseed wanted to uh, leave the country uh, with apple trees. He didn't want to write his name on any of the trees, but uh, he just wanted to do something uh, that would have consequences thereafter. And so I think that's in general what the, the term refers to. Okay. So what makes something an immortality project is that it leads to your being remembered. And so you live on either in memory or, or some other structure. Yeah, absolutely. So this would be generally uh, what Becker refers to as symbolic immortality, which he dates back to the ancient Greeks who pointed out that you may not live forever, uh, but that does not in any way diminish your desire to have some vestige of your existence per persist nonetheless. You know, maybe having kids, uh, making a boatload of money. Uh, doing a podcast, just anything that will preserve a vestige of our respective existences. And to tie everything back together, it's this pursuit of the immortality project that we engage in to mitigate the anxiety of death. Okay. And hmm, 
there are, there's now room to get into all sorts of different specifics. One thing that comes to mind is talking about different sorts of immortality projects. Did Becker have any particular views on the immortality projects of artists, writers, painters, these sorts of people? Were they particularly interesting immortality projects for him? Yes, for him, they were, Robinson. So uh, Becker had um, a controversial take on a, a lot of matters. Um, one is that he was devoutly religious himself. And so at the end of the denial of death, uh, he makes a plea for religious worldviews broadly defined a, as being potentially uh, more conducive to fostering psychological well-being than secular ones. And, and his view uh, and the way he put it in the book is that secular is always grounded to a certain degree in physical reality. Uh, and um, and any claim to perpetuity on that level uh, is yeah. apt to be dashed historically. So you can say that America is great. We're going to be here forever. But realistically, every country comes and goes. Uh, but if you have a worldview uh, based on an ethereal uh, and not tangible, can't be put into words, transcendent entity, that being God, um, well, then uh, uh, you are less likely to have uh, your cosmic view uh, of the universe undermined uh, by physical reality. So that's one aspect is that Becker was a big fan uh, of religious worldviews, while at the same time uh, being painfully and poignantly aware uh, of the dangers uh, of religious views. So he, t he quotes Paul Tillich, who says, look, on the one hand, religion at its best, uh, it, it grounds us uh, as no other uh, stance towards life is capable of. And yet, on the other hand, we get into trouble when we take our symbols too literally to the point where we've got to kill someone who doesn't share them. All right, so those that's the religious end of things. But then to get back to your question, uh, he saw creativity broadly defined, uh, using the artist uh, as the prototype, uh, as one of the most potentially constructive forms of death transcendence. And, and what he says is that what an artist does is to, to, to use their artwork that becomes their immortality project, that they literally take their existential concerns. Do you know Suzanne Langer's work? You may be too young, the American philosopher. She talked about, yeah, this is of yesteryear. But anyway, she talked about uh, art uh, being, she defines art as an uh, 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 objectification of subjectivity. Uh, it's not just an expression of feeling so much as uh, for Langer, she defined feeling very broadly as any sensation, whether we're aware of it or not. Uh, but she argued that art is a way that we can express ourselves, we could express our feelings uh, that cannot be expressed in words. And Becker jumps on that. And he says, yeah, what the artist does at their best it is to transform existential anxieties into some kind of physical manifestation that, according to Otto Rank in his book, Art and Artist, serves a social function uh, when the people who partake of the art are affected by it, not necessarily in the same way that the artist is or how the artist intended. Uh, but uh, well, Becker's argument is that uh, art is a prototype for humanity at its best uh, because it allows for creative individual expression that also has a pro-social dimension. A and that is that the artist is always hoping uh, to engage fellow humans in ways that 
uh, at best, are existentially uplifting for both parties. Hmm. I don't know if this is existentially uplifting, but as I hear you describe this uh, transference, and since we're talking about psychoanalysis, I don't mean transference in a psychoanalytic sense, but of existential dread into artwork, I think of Munch and the, the scream, angst, all of these paintings and how they certainly serve a, a social function. I don't, like I said, I don't think that, that they're uplifting, but they were a very successful immortality project for yeah. Munch. No, awesome. And for me, I, I'm not, uh, I love art, but I have no background. But the Van Gogh, Van Gogh's work is, I think, a, maybe for me, a more uplifting expression of someone clearly in uh, varying degrees of angst. But yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. One danger of religious views that you alluded to, but that we haven't touched on yet, but is particularly salient for me because I just did an episode on the world history of genocide, is that since these worldviews are so important to our self-esteem, and our Im immortality projects, when they are threatened by other worldviews that suggest that ours might not be the correct one, this historically results in a great deal of violence. Like look at things like genocides, like the Crusades, for instance, where of course there are, are financial motives, but they're also inherently uh, religious. That's right, and as Becker points out, it sometimes persists for centuries. I, I guess the conflict in Yugoslavia a few decades ago went back to the 1200s in terms of ongoing competition between competing worldviews. Hmm. Well, one last thing that I think I ought to ask before we move on to the worm at the core is whether or not you think there are any things that Becker got crucially wrong in the denial of death that maybe subsequent work has improved upon. Yeah. So again, Robinson, awesome. Um, I, I find it um, jarring to read the denial of death now, uh, 50 years later, um, because what it teaches me is that we're all beneficiaries and victims of the moment in which we're gestated and reared intellectually. Uh, to, or to put that another way, my students are horrified uh, generally when they read Becker. Um, now, some of it's stylistic because he's writing in a manly fashion uh, at a time um when that was quite common. All right, no big deal, my, but it, it, it is, as a teacher now, um, it's odd when the students are like, I can't read this asshole because he keeps calling people he. And I'm like, yeah, well, okay, but you're going to have to let that go. Aristotle had some odd ideas about women, but I don't think we should stop reading him because of that. Anyway, be that as it may, that's just a tiny um, stylistic point um, almost uh, the, the two things that are most glaring uh, are his take uh, on schizophrenia and, and homosexuality. Those, we, that's what stuck, sticks out at me as well. Yeah, they're absurd, uh, almost to the point of obscene, but they were the standard party line uh, at the time. Homosexuality, he's uh, going with it as a psychological aberration vis-a-vis -vis Freud. Uh, we now know that not to be true, um, and we can go into the details, but, you know, they saw autism, homosexuality, schizophrenia, uh, all as interchangeable manifestations of a poor parental environment, just all, you know, frankly, uh, ridiculous. So, uh, he did not understand or appreciate because we didn't know at the time uh, that homosexuality, autism, schizophrenia all have high heritability quotients. And that means that they're, there's a, they are in part uh, genetically determined. Uh, and 
Um, and so most of uh, and what I tell my students now is whenever you're reading the denial of death and you come across something ridiculous, just tear that page out. Not if you got the book from the library, but there's still enough pages left um, when uh, I feel like when you get done uh, that the work should still be taken seriously. So those are those are, I think, very real problems. They do not, however, I think, undercut the central claim of the book, which is that existential concerns about death are the motivational impetus for much of what we do. Uh, what I think um, at this point, though, I think that the major weakness uh, of Becker's ideas which is in turn a major weakness of our ideas, is uh, Becker's uh, conception of cultural worldviews as uh, being primarily uh, ways for us to reduce death anxiety uh, and with nothing else. In other words, if you read Becker or if you read terror management theory, uh, that's how uh, he and we define cultural worldviews, beliefs about reality that we share with people in our group uh, that uh, enable us to reduce anxiety. And, and while I believe that to be true, I think that that also misses like an enormous chunk of important ideas without which we can't understand much about human affairs. Have you heard of or know uh, Joseph Henrik? He's an anthropologist at Harvard. I do. And he, he writes about cultural evolution. Yeah. And so my thing, Robinson, is that I, I think that Becker's ideas need to be updated in light of Joe Henrik's work on cultural evolution and Michael Tomasello's work on developmental psychology, I think that Becker and our folks have missed the point somewhat uh, by seeing cultural worldviews as basically things that serve us as individuals in order to reduce anxiety uh, but that's evolutionarily myopic because we're fundamentally social animals, as Henrik points out, and, and cultural worldviews above and beyond existential balm are, are also uh, concentrated um, pieces of human experience accumulated over thousands of years that contain uh, knowledge without which we'd all be dead by sundown. So he Henrik's point is that whether we know it or not, uh, our belief systems are absolutely essential. As he put it, culture is smarter than any of us. Uh, and uh, unbeknownst to us, our, our cultural practices, our religious traditions uh, may uh, be the result of countless generations of experience that are now carefully ensconced in, in our way of viewing things. And, and so basically what Henrik argues is that we are highly motivated to maintain cultural belief systems, not so much because they reduce anxiety, uh, but because we need those beliefs to be maintained over time, uh, and uh, and that and that humans are therefore motivated to defer to authority and to conform to others' expectations, not just to reduce anxiety, but in the service of maintaining uh, all of these uh, pieces of knowledge. And I believe that to be right. And so I, I think that that's where Becker's work and what we call terror management theory, uh, that's what I'm presently trying to think about is to just be, um, you know, as, as Thomas Kuhn put it in, in the structure of scientific revolution, so to just normal science, to take uh, ideas and to integrate and synthesize with other paradigms that are prevalent at the time. 
Hmm. Well, I'm glad that we have been able to spend all this time talking about Becker, but you just mentioned terror management theory again, and I think it's time that we get there. And just as we began by fleshing out the key term of self-esteem, I think that before we get into the specifics of terror management theory, we ought to just flesh out what what terror means, how you how you really rigorously define it as a psychologist. Yeah, actually, we don't. It was a mistake to uh, <laughs> use that term. Okay, so, that's good to so, know, too. <laughs> yeah. No, no, Robinson, these are great. I'm enjoying this because I love your questions. So we read the Becker books in the 1980s, uh, and uh, we thought the ideas were compelling. Uh, and um, and the and anyway, to make a long story short, we we wrote a paper for the American Psychologist where we just described Becker's ideas. We're like, hey, we read a book. We think this guy uh, has uh, a lot uh, uh, of value. Uh, and anyway, the paper was rejected. Uh, uh, one of the reviewers with a single sentence. I have no doubt that these ideas are are of no interest to any psychologist alive or dead. And, and uh, and, you know, and eventually uh, we talked to the editor of the journal and he said, look, dude, uh, no one will take these ideas seriously in academic psychology unless you provide empirical evidence for them. And you guys are experimental psychologists. So why why don't you do that? And we're like, all right, crap, I guess this will give us something to do. Uh, so uh, we knew uh, uh, from an experimental point of view that our job was to take Becker's ideas in like 14 books and, and reduce it to a paragraph. That's basically a, a theory is just a set of conceptual declarations that allow you to generate hypotheses that can be subsequently subjected to empirical scrutiny. So that, so we're like, all right, uh, let's do that. And so we're, so what we call terror management theory Basically, we were being annoying. There was a theory at the time of self-esteem called impression management. And the argument there is that we want to have high self-esteem so that the people around us are impressed. Now, we don't disagree that that happens, but our point is that that's very superficial. So we're like, ultimately... You're not trying to manage other people's impressions. What you're really trying to manage is your own existential anxiety. And so that's where uh, we got the term terror management. Uh, and But it comes from a William James quote. I think he uses the word terror someplace. And then we had, you know, the munch, primal, the scream. Uh, but anyway, so terror management theory is just our haiku-like summation of Becker. It's the uniquely human awareness of death gives rise to potentially debilitating existential terror that we manage uh, by embracing cultural worldviews that give us a sense of meaning and value. Therefore, whether we're aware of it or not, uh, we are at all times fundamentally motivated to maintain a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. And finally, whenever we are challenged, our sense of meaning or value, or whenever concerns about death are aroused, we will respond defensively in ways to restore confidence in our beliefs and faith that we're people of value. So that's, that's kind of terror management theory in a nutshell. And we already talked about the one line of research, and that was to demonstrate that people, uh, when their self-esteem is raised, that anxiety goes down. Uh, the next line of research is what we call mortality salience. We were like, how do we prove that your beliefs and my beliefs reduce death anxiety? Well, we're like, okay, let's remind some people that they're going to die. And other people, let's have them think about something unpleasant but not fatal. Well, if death is is special, uh, then you should cling more tenaciously to your culturally constructed beliefs, and we should be able to detect that by measuring your reactions to aspects of those beliefs. So, uh, 
Sometimes we ask people to just write down, how do you feel about yourself dying? Other times we're a little more subtle. We do it outside the lab, but we stop some people in front of a cemetery, other people a hundred meters to either side. The coolest stuff is when we do it in the lab and people are like reading on a computer and we flash the word depth for 28 milliseconds so fast that you don't see anything. And so uh, anyway, there's now more than a thousand of these studies uh, and they show consistently that these very subtle reminders of death have potent effects uh, on attitudes and behavior. So when you're reminded uh, that you're going to die, uh, you hate and hurt uh, anybody who's different. When you're reminded that you're going to die, you become more slavishly devoted uh, to populist demagogues, be they Adolf Hitler or today's Donald Trump, Orange Hitler. It's the same phenomenon uh, when you're reminded that you're going to die. You deny that humans are animals. Uh, you piss on the planet uh, in an effort to ignore the physical environment uh, while you spend inordinate amounts of time uh, selfishly devoted to craving uh, money and stuff. Uh, and so... Um, and so that's that's another paradigm. We remind people that they're going to die, and it alters their attitudes and behaviors in predictable ways. And then we have one more uh, paradigm that we call the death thought accessibility paradigm, and that's if you challenge people's beliefs uh, or if you undermine their self-esteem, uh, that makes uh, unconscious thoughts of death come more readily to mind. Right, and then there's another boatload of studies that show the relationship between all of those paradigms. And so, for example, it, 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 normally if, I, if we remind a Christian that they're going to die, uh, they love Christians more and they hate Jewish people. Right, but if we raise self-esteem first and then remind people they're going to die, they do not become more derogatory towards folks who are different, just showing that all these concepts are interrelated. Hmm. Well, everything you've just said opens up about a hundred new lines of questioning. But just the first thing, you mentioned a, a, another William James quote in there. And if I'm not mistaken, the worm at the core, the title of your book comes from another one of his sayings. So he's just a, a gift that really keeps on giving. But maybe sticking again, just briefly before we get more deeply into the research to a more meta conceptual issue, how quite roughly do you manage to study death awareness and terror management in a laboratory setting when since do since due to ethical considerations, you can't just go around frightening people. There has to be like a limit to what you can do. Uh, how do you skirt these limits and make it work? There's a, actually, that's a fine point. What's makes this, um, it's very counterintuitive, Robinson. It's a great question. When we um, ask people to write down what they think about dying, they don't report any anxiety, nor do they become more physiologically aroused. Ditto when they're standing in front of a funeral parlor, uh, nor do people report any emotional distress when we flash the word death for 28 milliseconds. And so when we go to the uh, IRB, the Institutional Review Board, and we say we're going to remind some people about death. And often in, when we're working in schools, we use as a control condition, we ask people to think about their next exam. And every time we do this, the, the IRB comes back and they're like, you can't ask people to think about it, uh, themselves dying because that could be catastrophically traumatic. But there's now over a thousand studies with literally tens of thousands of participants 
and no one has yet uh, had any negative reactions to the death reminders that we use in these experiments as long as we screen for depression and suicidal ideation, if that makes sense. So as long as we pre-screen. All right, but the funny part is that if you want to make a college student really anxious and physiologically unsettled, ask them to think about an exam. Yeah. So our, our and because we have demonstrated and published uh, that for a college student, it is more harrowing to think about a test than to die. And that's what usually gets us to be able to do these studies. It's on empirical grounds. Uh, if we were really more brutal uh, and, you know, we're asking people to lay in a coffin or something, then it would be ethically problematic. Yeah. there. People always say or quote this. I don't know if it's a I'm assuming it's a result from or a series of results from experiments that people are more afraid of public speaking than dying. And whenever I heard that, I thought, well, this can't be right until I realized that the obviously people would rather public speak than die. But if you confront people with the possibility of public speaking or dying, then they're going to be more frightened of the public speaking. So it makes sense. But yeah, I'd like to now get into some of the research and the findings. And maybe uh, one way of doing this chronologically, in a sense, is to start with children. How quickly do children, as they mature, become aware of death? And how does it impact their thinking and behavior? How's this measured? Yeah, all right. Good question. And frankly, uh, I, we don't know. So there's a there is a substantial literature uh, on children and death. And in our book, we quote from a, a canonical work by Sylvia Anthony in the 1950s, where she a British psychologist who just demonstrated that kids are aware of and concerned about dying long before their parents think they are. A and long before their lives are in any particular danger. And so as early as two, but certainly for most people, by the time they're eight or nine, uh, there is some uh, awareness of death. A and uh, there are Israeli psychologists who demonstrated that by the time I think is nine or 10 years old, uh, that kids respond to the same, it's a death reminders uh, the same way that they do um, in our other studies. Um, no, but we don't have a, a very solid empirical handle on the developmental trajectory. Uh, all that we know uh, is, as I just said, that kids really are concerned more than we think. And so Sylvia Anthony uh, quotes a study um, where um, I think it's uh, five-year-old kids and their parents. And basically, they ask, they ask the kids and the parents, what are you more uh, afraid of, dying or a spelling test? And the parents are like, of course, my kid's more afraid of a spelling test. They don't know what death is, but they know what spelling is. And of course, the kids are like, fuck spelling. I don't want to die. Uh, and so we are uh, quite existentially oriented. And the, and the Becker point, by the way, is that, that, that basically what happens is that there comes a point that when we're kids where we become increasingly aware of our own mortality at the same time that we become simultaneously aware uh, that our parents are also mortal uh, and, and not perfect. And that's the psychological impetus to transfer a good proportion of our allegiance and attachment from our parents to the culture at large. In other words, when I'm growing up, I just want to be a good boy or girl in the eyes of my parents. Uh, once I get old enough to be somewhat aware that I'm going to die, uh, then I, I, I derive psychological comfort from being a good boy or girl 
in the eyes of the president or the pope or fill in the blank. It's the same psychodynamics that make us secure as infants with our attachment to parents is just now transferred and transformed to our attachments and adherence to cultural dictates. Hmm. Even if this hasn't been formally studied, I imagine that if children's nightmares and fears of the dark are universal across cultures, and maybe this has been um, studied, that might be indicative of a general onset of fear and awareness of death. Yeah. So we just talked about children. What do archaeology, anthropology, and maybe history tell us about how our ancestors dealt with their impending deaths and how it shaped their behavior? Yeah, great question. And like anything, depends on who you ask. Now, not surprisingly, we, uh, you know, so we we run into Becker and um, we thought that his ideas were compelling. But then just as you pointed out, Robinson, you asked, two great questions. You're like, well, how do you account for this developmentally? You know, now you're asking, well, what, how can we account for this phylogenetically or, you know, just uh, developmentally over history? And, and w w what we write in, in our book is that, you know, we see um, historically the claim is the so-called cultural big bang that simultaneously uh, is the appearance of like art, jewelry, and ritual burials with grave goods. Uh, and, you know, our, our point is, you know, not to be silly, but if, if you're going to spend, you know, hundreds of hours carefully preparing corpses to be uh, the, the embedded in the ground that, you know, why would you do that if you didn't expect there to be something happening thereafter. Uh, in other words, we see that uh, as indicative that uh, concerns about uh, mortality had a central role in human affairs. Things like Stonehenge, for example, just these big um, the, the stones that took a ton of time to make they don't appear to have any practical function. And and so uh, our claim following some other folks is just that we think that uh, that uh, when we talk about humans transitioning from semi-nomadic hunters and gatherers to settling down and, and living together, you know, the, the most common explanation is that we settled down in order to farm. But that's clearly wrong because it's not like people are like, oh, shit, we can't be wandering around anymore. Let's just sit still and grow a potato. Uh, we settled down first. And the argument is that that was for religious coagulations. And it was from the settling down uh, that agriculture thereafter uh, evolved. So anyway, those are all speculations. But by the time we get to the Epic of Gilgamesh, by the time, uh, you know, we get to the pyramids in Egypt and we get to the terracotta soldiers uh, in China and we get to the people uh, looking to turn, you know, lead into gold to get the elixir of life. Uh, by the time we get people traveling all over earth looking for the fountain of youth or magic berries that keep you from dying. It is fairly clear from the minute that there is a written record of human activity uh, that we have spent um, a substantial proportion of human energies in order to forestall death. Next, true to this day, the richest people on earth uh, at Google are pumping billions into abandoning their uh, carbon-based carcasses so that they can be uploaded on to some silicon web. Hmm. You mentioned earlier one problem with Becker's view that is still maybe a problem with yours, and that's connecting this conception of cultural worldviews to something that's more 
rigorous like what Joe Henrik at, at Harvard is doing. One other possible criticism that occurred to me, I'm wondering how you think about it. I was just thinking about my own life. And as I look at my own behavior, like uh, my urge to create a podcast, like you mentioned, or to learn or to enjoy good food or to date, the, the main the main aspects of my behavior, I don't see it so much as the product of a denial of death but kind of the opposite, the the fear of death and the knowledge that I know it's coming. So I have to cram it all in and it's not going to last and that time is wasting. And I'm wondering how you, how you weigh these two ways of, of looking at death. Um, yeah, again, Robinson, really good point. Not trying to sound defensive, but, you know, we read Becker's stuff 40 years ago at a time when we were trying to figure out the uh, the more unsavory and unfortunate aspects uh, of human existence. And so I think we were really skewed towards uh, death denial um, uh, when I and I think that's only half of the picture. Uh, there's a guy named Walter Burkert. He's dead. He was a Swiss guy who studied religion. And, and he's like, yeah, Religion, you know, religion is all about denying death. And uh, uh, in part, we deny death because we love life. Uh, and uh, I think that, and, and in fact, Becker on his deathbed, when he was being interviewed by Sam Keen, uh, you know, the Sam Keen dude is like, aren't you awfully one sided? Uh, and he's like, yeah, uh, I have been. And that's because. We got Abraham Maslow and all of these other folks talking about peak experiences and existential appreciation. And Becker was a big fan uh, of Maslow, and he did not want to deny or diminish the importance uh, of that end of life, as it were. But it wasn't his focus in the same with us. So to get back to your point, yes, I, I do think at least from my vantage point, that uh, I, I, it is time to step back and or or to just put it in a more pedestrian fashion. Uh, for me, uh, yeah, I, I'm more oriented now towards thinking in terms of life enhancing possibilities in light of existential concerns rather than death denying ones. Hmm. No, that is, that's great to know. So maybe to put this into my own words and see if it resonates with you at all, you're at this point less committed to the denial of death being the sole main driver of human behavior, but it is still an extremely important component of our motivation. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great to know. And then I think the last thing that we should touch on in these few minutes remaining to us is what I alluded to earlier as the potential prescriptive component of terror management theory. Does it, or do you and your collaborators suggest a way of life or a ways of approaching life to improve general well-being that is perhaps more effective than the current strategy of trying to uh, achieve fame and wealth and well, these sorts of things. That, yeah, our view, Robinson, is that we don't. Our prescription is to uh, try and have it both ways, and that's not to be explicitly prescriptive. So much as to point out that when things are not going well either from an individual or from a cultural perspective, uh, to put in a plea to step back and to identify the values uh, that we currently subscribe to determine, to determine uh, if they are realistically attainable. You know, or, to, or just to get back to Becker for a moment, you know, he, he, he points out that, um, you know, life is, is complex and that, you know, and so a, a lot of folks, you know, they do want to be the best at whatever they're doing. 
And yet, Becker points out that Christianity is one of the most democratic and ecumenical um, uh, belief systems in the history of Earth, uh, at least in principle. He's like, it doesn't matter if you're the president of General Motors or the dipstick for a cesspool. You can still, in God's eyes, uh, be a decent person and therefore qualified uh, for immortality. And so I guess that's been our uh, prescriptive musings these days, is is let's reflect on uh, the view of the world that we subscribe to and think about ways in principle that uh, everyone is capable of acquiring a sense of meaning of value. Hmm. I think hmm, the prescription that comes to mind for me, though, how it's to be achieved is another question entirely, is that in so much as self-esteem is how we nourish ourselves, I think that was something you might have quoted William James as saying, is that this self-esteem must be derived from within rather than from these highly contingent things like uh, wealth or how beautiful you're born. But like I said, the, the question is how how to derive that self-esteem. Uh, and again, I, I, this has been great, Robinson. And that's my silly thing is that if, that, and I say this to the students all the time, but I really appreciate you making this point. And that is that it is, uh, without trying to sound too trite or silly, sometimes it's pretty, quote, easy to figure out what ought to happen, but how to get there that's just a completely different concern. Yeah, which if we could do it, we'd be chugging rum out of coconuts on a beach with our Nobel Prizes. But that's why I think that I hope that these kinds of exchanges are useful for the people that will partake of what I thought was a great conversation because neither you nor I are are claiming to be the all-encompassing repositories of wisdom so much as folks that are interested in these ideas and to possibly parlay them uh, into action. You know, you're a philosopher. I love Peirce, Charles Peirce, you know, when he says beliefs are the basis of action and, and If there's a single person out in the world that hears what we've said today, and and it might impel them to come up with a radically creative idea of how to take this from aspirational to and transform it into practical application. So, yeah, if anyone has ideas, let's have them get in touch and then we'll do it. Well, uh, Sheldon, this has been terrific. It's been so fun. It's been a, a great excuse to talk about the denial of death and your work as well. So thanks again so much for doing this with me. Oh, thank you, Robinson. It was my pleasure. Hold on. If you haven't subscribed, liked, commented, or reviewed, that would be so helpful. And if you haven't yet, you could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Robinson Airhome.